From the Ear to Their Travel Studio, this is the Ear to Their Disney Podcast. The Ear to Their Podcast, it's time to start the show. Be sure to hold on tight, here we go. Exploring all the different Disney destinations. Ear to Their, it's time to start the fun. Hello, everybody. What is up? Welcome to the Ear to Their Disney Podcast. I'm your host, Phil Gramlick. I am also the owner and the founder of Ear to Their Travel, which is, of course, a Disney-specialized travel agency. It's my job to take away all of that stress, all that anxiety, and all that time that it takes to plan a Disney trip so you can focus on the fun things like having a phenomenal time with your family and friends and enjoying the magic. And I take away all that anxiety. I take away all that stress. I give you back all of that time. Because man, does it take a heck of a long time to plan a trip? I do all of that at absolutely no extra charge to you. So what does that mean? So from booking dining reservations, fast passes, getting you the best possible deal on your package or your hotel stay, to booking special event tickets, golf tee times, you name it, I do it all for free. So let me be your guide. Let me be your sidekick. Let me be the hey, hey to your Moana. Actually, that's not really a great example because hey, hey is constantly doing the wrong thing and getting Moana into trouble. Let's scratch that. Let me be the, the maybe the Maui to your Moana, whatever. I want to be your guide, your sidekick. Let me help you plan that next Disney vacation. You can find this podcast, my videos, Request a free, no obligation quote over at eartothertravel.com. This is episode number 139 for the week of September 3rd, 2018. Whoa, it's September. Hey, 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 body, yeah. <laughs> Say, do you remember, body, yeah. Dancing in September, body, yeah. Never was a cloudy day. <laughs> I think my, dude, that is the epitome of what Randy Jackson, the dog, would call pitchy. It's not just pitchy, it's terrible. Anyway, <laughs> grab a drink, grab a snack, and as a famous mouse once said, I'm all confused. <laughs> On with the show. And this episode is going to be kicked off like almost every numbered episode of the show, and that is with the What About Bob segment. Now, if you haven't heard, Disney legend and retired Imagineer Bob Gurr comes on the show each and every week. He answers your questions and mine. Now, if you haven't heard of Bob or you don't know who Bob is, Bob had over 100 designs of attractions in the Disney company, including the Autopia, the Omnimovie System, the Doom Buggies, the Main Street Vehicles, Walt Disney's personal Disneyland car, and many, many more. If you would like to get a question in for Bob to answer, you can call the voice line. That phone number is 267-551-1971. Or you can always email that question to me at phil at eartothertravel.com. And like each and every other week, the What About Bob segment of the show is brought to you by the Waltland Bus Tour. Each month, Bob takes a Bustle of people around Southern California with stops in Los Angeles and Burbank and in Glendale. Sorry, I forgot that last one. If you would like tickets for the Waltland bus tour, just head over to www.waltland.com. All right, here he is, the man who loves the number one car on the Autopia in Disneyland, the one, the only Disney legend, Bob Gurr. It's what about Bob? Bob Gurr, the legend, creator of the Matterhorn, the monorails and the haunted mansion. What about Bob, the Disney legend? So, Bob, speaking of vehicles that you designed and you built, do you remember how many vehicles off the top of your head, uh, Main Street vehicles that you built for the parks? Well, no, for Walt Disney, uh, for Disneyland, we we 
well, for Main Street, we built the uh, red car first, then we built the uh, yellow car, then we built Omnibus 1, then we built Omnibus 2, and then we built the fire engine. And, of course, at the same time, we um, in those years, we built the, um, or we designed, and the Carnation built the Carnation truck. And then uh, some years, uh, a little bit later, um, Global Van Lines wanted the same kind of a truck on the, on the front of their building. So I designed that. In fact, the, um, the uh, Global Van Lines um, vehicle just got restored. I, a few months ago, I went down to Long Beach to look at it. The guy was driving it around. And it's, it's all restored now, so it's going to be in an auction someday, somewhere. That's cool that all that stuff that you built yeah. is still uh, out there. Yeah. yeah, and then the Main Street vehicles at uh, Disney at Walt Disney World, um, the car was a little bit longer because we used a four-cylinder engine instead of a two-cylinder engine because the, the factory that built the two-cylinder engines, their pattern shop burned down in a fire, so we couldn't get that same engine again. Um so I did not directly design those cars. I laid out all the design and art directed the details with our draftsmen uh, to build the antiques for um, Walt Disney World. And, of course, they uh, for World Showcase, they built several uh, omnibuses, double decks, exactly the same as we have at Disneyland. But uh, they, they didn't seem to be successful going through the crowds and way. And, uh, uh, World Showcase, so they, Disney sold them off. And about 10, 15 years ago, a guy sent me pictures of um, of uh, one of those buses, and he was restoring it, and somehow they'd lost the fenders and lost the headlights for it. So I managed to dig out the drawings of the fenders and the headlight and sent it down, and they, uh, uh, they, they completed the restoration. Last I saw, the guy sold it for $400,000. Wow. And thanks to Bob for answering yet another question on the show. If you think about it, it's incredible and amazing how many things he actually designed and built all over in Disneyland and Walt Disney World. So it's it's incredible. So thank you again to Bob. And we are now moving on, or <laughs> I am moving on to episode 139. If you're not a totally frequent and often listener, is that right? Often listener? Let's go with it. Of the podcast. You might think, if you've listened here and there, that to me, Disney can do no wrong. Well, that's simply not true. I like more in Walt Disney World and Disneyland and on the cruise ship than I dislike by a long shot. That's true. But... There are some things that I don't like. Disney has made some flops, shall we say, and mistakes along the way. And this week, I want to talk about the worst or the best, I guess, the biggest Disney flops. Now I'm talking purely in the parks and resorts in Walt Disney World and Disneyland, really. And it's just me this week because I want to give you my thoughts on these. I don't want to have to argue <laughs> with a friend or a co-host who wants to put their ideas out there. This was <laughs> this is all me. You know how it goes. I have somebody like Johnny Shortsleeve or Chuck or somebody else on the show. We argue about things. That's always fun. But this week, this is all me. So let's get into it. And I might mention some things that you think are flops or you don't like as a listener and you've told me and I, now I have to kind of refute them. But we're going to start with the things that I think over the, the history of Walt Disney World and Disneyland have come in as the biggest flops. To start off, really, I could name the entire, entire park of Disney California Adventure up until just, you know, several years ago. The park opened on February 8th, 2001 and expected really big crowds. So much so that Disney thought, or Disneyland execs thought, they'd be turning away guests at the gate in that first year. Well, 
surprise, surprise, <laughs> guests did not feel the same way. As a matter of fact, in its opening year in 2001, Disney California Adventure only saw 5 million guests, while the park across the way, the original Disneyland Park, entertained 12.3 million guests. So just think about that. Brand new park, 22 opening day shows and attractions, 15 opening day restaurants, total and utter flop. <laughs> and I want to get into some of the things inside Disney California Adventure back in the day that made it a flop, but that's just setting the tone for the show. That park, as it was originally designed, was given the okay for a complete overhaul and retheme six years after it opened. So Disney noticed, listen, this park isn't working. People aren't coming. The opposite of Ray Kinsella, if you build it, they will come. Disney built it and no one came. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about some of the specific things. Not in California Adventure yet, but we're going to go to one of the first ever flops for Disney and a Disney company, and that was in Disneyland. And in 1955, they opened the Intimate Apparel Shop on Main Street, USA. Yes, that's right. I did say the Intimate Apparel Shop. And let's be totally transparent and honest here. This was a shop where you could walk in and buy bras and corsets and all kinds of lovely <laughs> things. If you were a lady, I guess, or a gentleman of the time in the 1950s. So go just to give you a little background, going back to the 1950s, there was a lingerie company named the Hollywood Maxwell Company. They were the big guns in the women undergarments area. So it made sense to Walt Disney in 1954, 1955 for the Hollywood Maxwell Brazier Company to give Walt Disney a check in exchange for their sponsorship and the right to sell their products right inside the park on Main Street USA. Not only that, but there was a little show, a little presentation inside the Intimate Apparel Shop called The Wizard of Bras. Yes, that's right. The Wizard of Bras. Now, you could find the narration for that little show online. If you go to YouTube or you just Google it, you can find the original Wizard of Bras narration. Now, one cool thing about the Intimate Apparel Shop, or the Wizard of Bras, as it was nicknamed, was that it had a porch. It was the only shop on Main Street USA in Disneyland that had a porch and also a couple of chairs out on the porch. There's a couple of theories as to why this was chosen to have a porch. One of them was that since it was selling intimate apparel, only adults should be able to look in the windows. So contrary to the other windows on Main Street USA, which are all bigger and lower to the ground so kids can look in, these windows were up on the porch so kids could not look inside. That's the first theory as to why there was a porch there. The second theory was that, look, I'm a guy, right? I don't want to go in and shop for bras. <laughs> I can't even say it, but this is the second theory. I don't want to go into the bra shop or the intimate apparel shop in 1955 and shop for intimate apparel or underwear underpants <laughs> with my wife, right? So those chairs and that porch were outside for gentlemen like me of the time to sit outside while our wives shopped in the intimate apparel shop. So I have to think that as an early guest, as an early patron to Disneyland, you'd be pretty darn surprised to be walking down the street, look up in the window and see the Intimate Apparel Shop. So it was a flop. It didn't last very long. As a matter of fact, the store only lasted about six months. The Glass and China Shop next door took over the space and expanded into that space. It's now called the China Closet in Disneyland. And that porch is still there. So you can get actually walk up the stairs, three little steps, go onto the porch and hang out. Although that door does not open. The door that once led 
to the Intimate Apparel Shop to the Wizard of Bras is now closed for good. All right, so that is the first one. And we're off to a rollicking rolling start talking all about the Wizard of Bras for the first example. Okay, so my next one, my next biggest flop, is going to be a stretch. And it's only a stretch because I think this is only a huge flop if you're a Star Wars fan. You know what? Scratch that. It's a, it's a flop. And let me tell you why. In 1989, in, it just reminded me of Twilight Zone Tower of Terror, Hollywood, 1939. That's not a real Rod Serling impression. I, I can't do Rod Serling. Anyway, in 1989, in the then Disney's MGM Studios, a little ride opened called Star Tours. Now, Star Tours opened a couple years before, and Disneyland was a big, big hit. So not only did they bring the attraction itself to Disney MGM Studios, they brought a kind of like a mini land with it, right? You got the big at-at outside the, the, the walker, which works still really, really well if you're out in front of it. And then if you're behind it, it looks like a piece of a movie set, which again is what Hollywood Studios was originally supposed to be. So it's confusing. But you had the at-at, you had the Ewok Village there. I don't know if anybody's an 80s kid like me. Did you have the, the Ewok Village playset growing up? I did. I loved the Ewok Village playset. I've looked to get it again on eBay, but I'm running out of room in my office. I need to get a new room. I need to like build a new room in my home that'll just be for toys that I collect that my mom gave to my little cousins <laughs> when I was went, went away to college. That was, by the way, a shocking moment. I came home. I was like, Wait, where are all my G.I. Joes? Where are all my mask toys? Where are my Star Wars guys? Where are my baseball cards? My mom's like, yeah, I gave something to your brother. The other ones I gave to your cousin. So deal with it. <laughs> Never forgiving her for that. All right. So, sorry. So, yeah, there was the Adat. There was the Ewok Village. And then there was Endor Vendors. No, it doesn't rhyme, really. It's not Endor Vendors. But you get it. Endor Vendors was the store that was right next door to the Ewok Village, it was the store in which Star Tours dumped you out into, and it was perfect because the outside of Endor Vendors looked just like the Imperial base in The Return of the Jedi. Remember when Han and Leia go up to the front of it and then they're trying to break into the base, and then R2-D2 comes up and gets fried trying to... That, that base. So it's a cool part of the movie. They get into the base. Anyway, the Endor Vendor store looked just like that base. So what happens? Well, George Lucas comes out with the first prequel to Star Wars, The Phantom Menace, which I think a lot of Star Wars fans have it right when they just pretend this movie doesn't exist. Listen, it's not Lucasfilm's best couple of hours. It's, it's kind of a lousy Star Wars movie. Does the kid ruin it? The kid might ruin it. That the kid that plays Anakin, I know he's going on to have kind of a troubled uh, adulthood. But anyway, Lucas makes the Phantom Menace. Disney decides, hey, let's cash in on this Phantom Menace thing. Let's make Endor Vendors into Tatooine traders, which makes absolutely, first of all, it makes no sense, right? How could the Ewok village be right next door to a Tatooine desert planet? They're two different planets. One is a forest planet with redwoods and trees, and the other one's a complete desert planet where Luke Skywalker grew up and where Anakin and his dad grew up before him. It's a dump. It's a desert. So how could these two things be right next to each other in a Disney theme park, right? Where it is supposed to be themed down to every little nuance, every little thing. Somehow, Disney Imagineers were like, yeah, let's do this. Makes no sense story-wise at all. <laughs> you can hear me getting upset about this. I can't believe I have to get upset about this, but I do. Because every time I walk by it, I think to myself, this shouldn't look like this. If you look at the ad app by itself, looks awesome. If you look at the Ewok Village by itself, looks awesome. If you look at Tatooine Traders by itself, Looks awesome. Looks like it should be something on Tatooine. But you put it right next door to Endor and it makes no sense. 
Therefore, to me, this is another one of Disney's big flops. And listen, you know me, I'm not a negative person, but this is a flop, Disney, so fix it. And I just saw that in just a couple of days now, Tatooine Traders is undergoing a refurbishment. And when I read that online, I got super excited. I was like, yeah, about time they're going to fix this. They're going to bring Endor vendors back. No, they're just changing some things inside the store. Apparently, as far as we know right now, the store, the exterior of the store is staying the same for now. So we could dream when Star Wars Galaxy's Edge, this is another big thing. And yes, I know this is a tangent. And if you came here not expecting tangents, you are unfortunately listening to the wrong podcast (laughs) because I go on tangents, but this is a somewhat related tangent. What do you think, like right now, you're in your car, you're on a treadmill, you're out for a walk, you're cleaning up after the kids. What do you think they're going to do once Galaxy's Edge opens? Because Star Tours and Tatooine Traders aren't right next door to Galaxy's Edge. They don't touch. So how are we going to, are they going to stay? Are we going to just pretend that there's not this huge Star Wars land in the park, and there's this, you know, standalone attraction and standalone store somewhere else in the park? That's weird. I wonder what Disney Imagineers have cooked up for this. I hope that we don't lose Star Tours. I think it's still a great attraction. I ride it every time I'm in Hollywood Studios, so I don't want it to go anywhere. Maybe they could put, like, (laughs) like a, you know those walkways that they put over really busy highways in like cities theme that to like walking through a disney hallway (laughs) make like stars and planets and stuff like look like it's glass inside when you're walking through i'm in just theme it better than putting endor right next to tatooine please okay so so far for like the first 15 minutes of the podcast the two biggest flops for me have been stores so let's go to an attraction and let's talk about one of the Biggest flop attractions ever, 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 and that is the Haunted Mansion. I'm kidding. (laughs) Don't don't crash your car to a telephone pole. I love the Haunted Mansion, and it's a classic and one of my favorite attractions of all time. (laughs) I actually wanted to see what you would do. What did you do? All right. No, of course I am talking about Stitches. Great escape. And honestly, it is it this attraction. I was told by a theme park insider who knows these these types of things. It is the worst received attraction, I believe, in the history of Walt Disney World. So it's not just bloggers and podcasters that didn't like it. It's guests, it's everyone, it's people who work there. <laughs> Disney has a grade that they do. There's like a scoring system and there's a number that they give to attractions that let you know how well these attractions perform. Stitch's great escape performed so poorly that not having an attraction in that building, having an empty building gives Tomorrowland a better score than having Stitch's great escape in that building. That's true. So this attraction opened In November of 2004, it replaced an excellent attraction that I'll talk about in a couple of minutes. So the plot here was, not is, because this attraction now mercifully is gone. The plot was that a level three prisoner was going to be transported into the chamber where the guests were sitting in the Galactic Federation Prisoner Teleport Center. So yeah, it's a level three prisoner, of course. That level three prisoner is Stitch. He gets beamed in to borrow a phrase from another sci-fi universe, which I'm not a fan of, by the way. I think you're a Star Wars or a Star Trek. There's very few people who are both. I'm, I'm a Star Wars guy, not a Star Trek guy. Although I did see, again, sorry, tangent. Have you watched that show Black Mirror? If you haven't watched Black Mirror on Netflix, it's a show from the United Kingdom. It's an excellent anthology series. Each episode is its own little standalone movie. And there's an episode where it's kind of an homage to Star Trek and Star Trek fans 
where a guy is a computer video game programmer and he designs his own video game that's like a simulation of a Star Trek knockoff. It's kind of a frightening episode. If you watch, if, if you want to get a good show, want to start watching a good show, give Black Mirror a chance on Netflix. It's really good. Anyway, so they transport Stitch into the chamber. You're there. He breaks out. Quote, unquote, hilarity is supposed to ensue. The attraction was not a great one. The, the, there are some pretty neat effects in this one, particularly the cannons, the laser guns that were mounted to the ceiling that were supposed to kind of follow Stitch wherever he went. They were really, really cool and a neat piece of technology when the attraction opened. But then in my subsequent visits to the show, they never worked. Or like one gun would work and the other one would just sit still. It just didn't, it, for some reason, everything kind of fell apart on that show. Then there was, of course, Stitch bouncing around on people. They're burping the chili dog directly into your mouth, which was pretty gross. Let's be for real. That was really gross. <laughs> so yeah, this one was not well received at all. It was open for a long time, for 12 years straight. So for one of the worst attractions, if not the worst attraction in the history of Walt Disney World, it is actually pretty amazing that it stayed around for 12 years. And of course, it replaced the, not maybe not a crowd favorite or fan favorite, but a favorite of mine, which was the extraterrestrial alien encounter. I'm not a huge fan of scary movies. I like scary movies enough. And I enjoyed them enough that I really, really liked Alien Encounter. I loved the pre-show with the Tim Curry Sir robot. I loved Skippy when he tried to transfer him from tube to tube. I loved everything about being in the room, in the showroom, when the alien burst out from the sounds of him walking behind you to him breathing on your neck. No, it wasn't a chili dog. It was just this warm breath. So you could feel him pressing down on your shoulder harness. Oh, it was awesome. Then the poor tech. Remember the tech who came to help you? He was up in the rafters. You saw the flashlight whipping around up there. Then he was killed. He was ki literally killed by the alien. Like ripped apart. And what I only believe to be blood was, it was actually just water, but <laughs> what was supposed to be blood was sprayed all over you after the poor tech was killed. By the way, little known fact, did you know that was an actual cast member up there with a the flashlight? That wasn't just a cool effect. There was, there had to be a cast member standing up there with a the flashlight every show to get that cool flashlight effect. So it was a recorded voice for the show, but the tech upstairs was actually a cast member. Pretty cool. Anyway, yes, Stitch's Great Escape was one of the biggest if not the biggest flops that Walt Disney World has ever seen. And again, the fact that it lasted for 12 years blows my mind. Okay, for the next big flop, let's go back to Disneyland. And in 1961, Disneyland opened an attraction called the Flying Saucers. This was designed by my friend Bob Gurr and built by Arrow Development and installed into the park. And it just never caught on. Guests couldn't figure out how the heck to control the things. As a matter of fact, it would take guests like three or four rides on the flying saucers to get the hang of it. And remember, this is when Disneyland was using the old school coupon books for tickets. So you had to pay every time you wanted to ride the flying saucers. Not only that, the lift that you got on the attraction was completely dependent on how much the vehicle, your own flying saucer, weighed with you inside of it. So if you were a larger person, a heavier person, you would just sit there. You wouldn't go anywhere. So this ride was a flop. And I hate to do this to Bob, but Bob will tell you that it didn't work. So. The attraction was shut down in September of 1966 before the Tomorrowland refurbishment in Disneyland. But that didn't end there. Oh, no. <laughs> the Flying Saucers 
kind of had a comeback. So in 2012, over in Cars Land in Disney California Adventure, Disney opened Luigi's Flying Tires. This was basically the same attraction as the original Flying Saucers, except now there were two or three guests per vehicle, and it still didn't work. A really <laughs> a good story about that is I talked to Bob about the building of Luigi's Flying Tires, and I think that made a previous episode. I have to be honest, I don't know which episode it was. It may have been the standalone episode with Bob. That was episode, shoot, 81, I believe. But Bob talks about how Disney Imagineers invited into Imagineering to take a look at the vehicle, the flying tire from that attraction. And he got in it and he said, okay, well, what you have to do is cut the capacity and the weight or it'll never work. Of course, Bob knew from the failure of the original Flying Saucers that it wouldn't work like that. Unfortunately, Imagineering did not listen to him and the attraction closed in Cars Land in 2015. So did Disney learn its lesson? Did Imagineering learn its lesson with these Flying Saucer style attractions? I guess we'll have to wait until Galaxy's Edge opens in Hollywood Studios. Of course, that part of the park will have the Hans Flying Falcons attraction. No, <laughs> no, well, I'm kidding. There will be no floating Millennium Falcon attraction, at least not one that will be like the Flying Saucers. Okay. Did I get you there for a minute, though? I bet I got somebody. Somebody right now is really, really red because I got them. Okay. All right, moving on, let's talk about April 5th, 1998. It was a dark day in Adventureland, my friends. Why was it such a dark day, you may ask? Well, thank you for asking. I will tell you. Of course, that is because that is the day when the Enchanted Tiki Room under new management opened in Adventureland in the Magic Kingdom. And again, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer. But this one, like Ned Ryerson says in Groundhog Day, it was a doozy. <laughs> this, was, this was a bad, just a bad attraction. So in 1971, Tropical Serenade had opened in Magic Kingdom. Now, don't let the name Tropical Serenade fool you. It was a carbon copy of the Enchanted Tiki Room that had been playing in Disneyland since the 60s. The only difference was there was a different pre-show in Magic Kingdom than there was in Disneyland. So for some reason, Disney Imagineers decided that the show needed to be kind of brought up to the 90s, made a little quote-unquote hip. And when it reopened in 1998, it had Gilbert Gottfried and Zazu. <laughs> Iago from Aladdin and Zazu from The Lion King interrupt the show and just wreak havoc on the Walt Disney classic, on the Roly Crump classic. If you know me, if you listen to this show, you know that I am a big time nerdy Disney classics fan. Don't mess with my Tiki Room. So they did. If you remember, the show started the same way with the original Tiki Bird starting the show. And then Iago kind of interrupts, not kind of, I mean, rudely <laughs> interrupts and starts telling the Tiki Birds, listen, you're boring. This show's been boring. It's been here since 1963. Of course, it was in Disneyland since 1963, but still. So Iago's singing songs. You never had a friend like me from Aladdin, blah, blah, blah. And he's trying to get the Tiki Birds to be hip. And I had this song memorized because I had the CD in my car and my wife used to listen to it all the time. And she actually liked this song, which kind of drove me crazy. But there was the one part where uh, Iago sings, You are boring, tiki birds. I'm a big celebrity. Terrible. So <laughs> anyway, Zazu chimes in and is like, Yo, what's up, Iago? Listen, let's not do this. Let's not get these tiki guys angry because you won't like them when they're angry. Anyway, lots of pop songs were used in this version, like Hot, Hot, Hot in the Still of the Night. I think there was a Boys the Men song in there. Get On Your Feet by Gloria Stefan was in there. And I can remember Zazu telling Iago 
that where he came from, nowhere he's met was Hakuna Matata. And Iago was like, Hunky Tuna Tostada? <laughs> That's my Gilbert Gottfried. Anyway, the show stunk. Let's be for real, people. You might be a fan of it because you grew up with it. I'm sorry. The show was a disaster. So, and it was not timeless. Like the Tiki Room, the Enchanted Tiki Room, Walt Disney's Enchanted Tiki Room is a timeless attraction. This was not. This was stuck in the 90s because of the music, because of the characters. And it had no chance of really working past a year or two. But the amazing thing about this attraction was one night, a fire broke out. The rumor was that the Iago audio animatronic caught fire, was damaged beyond repair, and the Disney company decided that rather than rebuild that version of the attraction, they would go back to the original attraction, and they opened Walt Disney's Enchanted Tiki Room on August 15th, 2011. And you could hear the smile on my face. <laughs> so that attraction was, that, that strange under new management attraction was a bit of a flop. Okay, now another attraction, another dark day in the history of Walt Disney World was October 1st, 1999. That was the day that Journey Into Your Imagination opened in Epcot. Now, Journey into, into Your Imagination, excuse me, replaced the popular with guests original Journey Into Imagination. Journey Into Imagination opened in 1983, featured Figment and the Dreamfinder and wonderful imaginative songs and set pieces and was just a really a beautifully done, kind of very well-remembered attraction. No one looks back on Journey into Imagination and thinks, wow, that was a lousy attraction. But by 1998, there just weren't really long lines for Journey into Imagination. So it closed, was rethemed, and then reopened in, like I said, October of 99 as Journey into Your Imagination. And it was almost instantly just universally panned by guests. The storyline was that you would start the attraction going through a scanner and the scanner would reveal that the guests that were going through that scanner had no imagination. So Dr. Nigel Channing, who was played by Eric Idle and still is in this attraction, he also played Dr. Nigel Ch Channing in the Honey, I Shrunk the Audience attraction, which was in the same pavilion. Nigel Channing decides to send the guests through a whole bunch of labs where we would learn and figure out and develop our imagination. What really bothered fans when this version of the attraction opened was Figment wasn't there. As a matter of fact, he was kind of in the queue in a couple of little, little shots and films in the beginning of the queue. He was represented by a constellation, a star constellation in the attraction. And then you heard his voice at the finale, but you never saw him. People were not happy. Well, this attraction only lasted a little more than two years. And it was closed on October 8th of 2001. On June 2nd, 2002, Journey into Imagination with Figment opened. Generally was kind of mixed reviews. Figment came back. He's on the entire attraction. The song One Little Spark by the Sherman Brothers is in the attraction. Like I said, Dr. Nigel Channing is still there. And for a lot of people, like my kids, this is the only version of the Imagination attraction that they've seen. So they really enjoy it. I enjoy it with them. But I think a lot of Disney fans would still even call this one a flop. And I know for a fact that most Disney fans, like myself, most diehard kind of hardcore Disney fans called that middle version a flop. All right. So you want to talk flops. Let's talk flops. Let's talk. Let's, let's cut to the chase here and talk about one of the worst decisions and worst uses of real estate of land that Disney's ever, ever developed. 
Let's talk about Disney California Adventure and the Bountiful Valley Farm. So if you've never been to Disney California Adventure, you may never heard of the Bountiful Valley Farm. Now, when I say bountiful, I'm saying B-O-U-N-T-I-F-U-L. That's how you spell it. So it was located around where Bugs Land is located today. Well, not for much longer. As we all know, Bugs Land is closing very soon for Marvel Land in Disney California Adventure. But in 2001, when California Adventure opened, the Bountiful Valley Farm was a tribute to the abundance and diversity of agriculture in California. This attraction, I guess you can call it, was presented by Caterpillar. And when I say Caterpillar, I don't mean a bug from a bug's land. No, it's not Heimlich. (laughs) It is the farm equipment maker and distributor, Caterpillar. So where else, in what other theme park on the planet could you ever find an, an amazingly fun attraction that showcased farming equipment. Well, look no further, my friends, than early to late 2000s at Disney California Adventure. I mean, you would walk around and see flowers. You would see some oranges. You would see some scarecrows, some bulldozers. You would even see two fake cows. Yes, not one fake cow. But two, (laughs) there was a sign. (laughs) Sorry, this is funny to me. I hope you're laughing. I just, the silliness of this attraction cracks me up. There was a sign. I remember walking through this thing in 2008. I was on my honeymoon with Amy, my wife, and we were walking through and I'm like, what is, what is going on? So there's a sign next to the two cows and I'm going to read it. There's a quote and it's since the first herd of beef cattle was moved yes there's two o's in moved (laughs) to california in 1774 production of cattle and calves has become the fourth most valuable farm product in the state with over 1 million cows producing milk california is the nation's number one dairy state so when you walked a little further into the attraction again i'm putting that in quotes there were caterpillar tractors that you could look at You couldn't get in them, though. I think there was one that you could actually get in the cab of. But most of them, the antique ones especially, you just got to walk by and look at. So then there was a store, which was amazing. The Santa Rosa Seed and Supply Store was there for you to buy your gardening supplies, your plants, and your flowers. So think about those little pop-up stores that come around at the Epcot Flower and Garden Festival. But that was there for like a decade. (laughs) So yes, Bountiful Valley Farm was just a strange use of land. Disney California Adventure did not know what it was going to be in the first several years of its existence, and this is exactly the example that proves that. All right. All right, on to my... Let's let's just get this out of the way right now. My least favorite attraction, maybe it's not a flop, but my least favorite attraction... That was added to Walt Disney World in my history. During my lifetime of going to the Disney theme parks, you know what I'm going to say already if you listen to the show, and it is the magic carpets of Aladdin. Look, I'm sorry. I can't get into this one. It's in a prime spot in Adventureland. I mean, you're walking through Adventureland. It's just right there in the middle of everything. And I'm not a grumpy old man. I don't mind the spinner attraction. I really don't. I like Dumbo. I thought putting two Dumbos in, fantastic idea. It's actually aesthetically beautiful over in the Storybook Circus part of the park. Adventureland is such a cool and well-themed, original, kind of beautifully landscaped land. Why do we need a big plastic hunk of monstrosity in the middle of it. I don't know. Yeah, I know. The camels that spit are from the Aladdin parade. They're cute. It's fun to get wet by the camel. (laughs) Listen, I might sound like a grumpy old man. I never wanted this attraction here. I still don't want it there. I don't like it. I sound like a little kid. I don't like it. (laughs) I don't. I don't like it. So that's my biggest flop. 
but it's not the biggest flop in Disney history. Of course, a lot of families, a lot of little kids really enjoy it. My kids like it. I will not ride with them. I tell them no. I tell them, grow up. You're seven and five. <laughs> I've never said that, but I feel like saying that. <laughs> I'm kidding. I love my children. But if I can avoid this attraction, I will. I don't want to wait in the sun to sit on a spinning carpet attraction that has no history. Sorry. <laughs> Again, grumpy old man alert. My grumpy old man part is over. The next one that I'm going to bring up is one that I think everyone will agree with. This is the biggest flop, the biggest flop in the history, in the history of the Disney theme parks worldwide, I believe. I think there's never been a bigger, bigger flop than getting rid of the people mover in Disneyland's Tomorrowland. And the reason, now, first of all, getting rid of the people mover in Tomorrowland, in Disneyland, was a huge, huge no-no from, from Jump Street. The people mover was Walt Disney, right? It had that City of Tomorrow, Epcot kind of feel to it. It was the transportation of Tomorrow, the Omnimover system. It was a way to just see Tomorrowland from above. Just like Magic Kingdoms is today and has been since the 70s. It was just a really beautiful, well done, very cool attraction. If you're a big Walt Disney World fan, you may never have seen the way these had the automatic doors like the ones in Walt Disney World have, but also it had a roof on each individual vehicle and the roof would tilt back so adults could kind of get in. And then when you sat down, the roof tilted back over you. I've never, I never got the chance to ride it, but I've watched countless videos and have talked to my Disneyland friends who who grew up in California and who know the park. So the People Mover opened in 1967 and in 1998, Michael Eisner, oh, Michael Eisner, did so many things well at the beginning and the middle, did so many things badly at the end. But Michael Eisner decided that, listen, the People Mover is boring. It's a slow ride around Tomorrowland, around the park. Nothing really happens. Let's speed it up a little bit. Let's put something new up there on that track that gives guests the thrill, and it's exciting, and it's fast. So what did they do? They shut down and removed the people mover forever. And on May 22nd, 1998, Rocket Rods opened in Disneyland and was a bomb. Like a smelly, stinky <laughs> bomb. Guests would board a five-seat rocket ride vehicle. Five seats, which is really weird. And they would follow along the same old track as the People Mover. But the idea for Rocket Rods was it would be a thrilling high-speed attraction on that same track. Well, Disney Imagineers didn't bank the turns on this track which meant that the ride vehicles couldn't take the turns at high speeds. So the vehicle would speed up and accelerate, then have to almost stop to make a turn, then accelerate again, then almost stop again to make a turn. It just didn't work. So a little over a month after the attraction had first opened, in July of 1998, it was shut down. Originally, they were saying the attraction will be down for about five weeks for repairs and to get it up to speed. And it ended up being down for three months. Rocket Rods reopened in October of 1998. Had almost two years of bumpy, shall we say, operation. And it was closed again in September of 2000 for quote unquote refurbishment. But no work was ever seen being done on the track or on the attraction itself. And in April of 2001, the LA Times reported that Rocket Rides would never again reopen. So for years, people have been clamoring for and guests have been asking, bring back the People Mover, bring back the People Mover. Well, another thing that Rocket Rides apparently did was, listen, that track, that support structure was not built for high-speed vehicles. And the word is that those Rocket Rides attraction vehicles permanently damaged the structure of that people mover track. 
So even if Disney wanted to bring back the People Mover, they would have to tear down that entire track, rebuild it. And I'm not saying that's never going to happen, but it seems kind of unlikely with where Tomorrowland is headed in the future. So that's it. Those were my biggest flops in the history of the Disney parks. Now, I wanted to mention just a couple that you have told me are flops. Other guests, Disney fans, friends have told me are flops, but I kind of disagree with. That might just be me being like a jolly jolly, <laughs> and I like these things. So let's go with a couple of these things that I've been, I've been told are flops, but I kind of disagree with. Okay, the first one is replacing Snow White's Scary Adventures with the still very popular meet and greet location of Princess Fairytale Hall. I know that the Snow White Scary Adventure attraction was an original attraction. I really, really do enjoy riding it in Disneyland. I think it's it's so still really, really well done. But with Seven Dwarfs Mine Train coming in, it was another Snow White attraction. It didn't have to be there. Little girls and boys really, really love the princess meet and greet. So I'm okay with it. I enjoy it. My girls really, really enjoy it. I think my wife enjoys it as much as the girls do. So to me, that is not a flop. I really like Princess Fairytale Hall. I get what it replaced, but it makes sense not to have two Snow White attractions kind of right in the same neighborhood. Another one talking about princesses, of course, is Frozen Ever After that replaced Norway's Maelstrom. Listen, I have to admit, when I first heard that Frozen was coming to Norway, I, like you, probably thought, eh, Arendelle isn't real, Norway is. I hope they kind of maintain that Norwegian feel of that uh, pavilion. And I think they really did, for the most part. There's nothing outwardly frozen about the Norway pavilion until you go into those buildings. When you're walking by or through the pavilion, it still feels very authentic to, well, I've never been to Norway, but I've seen it in videos. <laughs> so it feels very authentic to the YouTube videos I've watched. Listen, Frozen Ever After replacing Maelstrom, I get there are still Maelstrom fans out there that are upset. I'm not. I, I enjoy Frozen Ever After with my kids. So that could be a flop for a lot of you folks out there who are listening. For me, it is not. Another one I hear a lot is the loss of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. And it does make you wonder if Disneyland can continue to operate a submarine attraction. Why couldn't Walt Disney World? And what did we get in place of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea? Which was, listen, granted, a fantastic, a very, very cool, imaginative attraction. A beautiful attraction that I was kind of sad to see go. But what did we get to replace it? Well, we got Storybook Circus. We got all of New Fantasyland. So I think we made out okay as far as being Disney World fans with the loss of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Although I still do like to, on occasion, jump onto YouTube and go down a rabbit hole and take a spin on the submarine on a Nautilus. There are awesome YouTube videos out there. And I did a podcast, actually, that talks about 20,000 Leagues and takes you on a, uh, a virtual tour of 20,000, or virtual ride through, I'm sorry, of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. So that is really cool. That one, I think, is Word of the Week Nautilus, if you want to take a ride with me on the Nautilus virtually. And here's my last one. My last flop that I don't agree with is Navi River Journey. I don't know how, I really don't know how you can ride that attraction and say it's not good. Again, call me a Disney nerd, call me a super fan, call me whatever you want. And I did ride Flight of Passage first. So admittedly, when I rode uh, Navi River Journey for the first time, I was like, all right, that's cool. I didn't love it. I didn't hate it. I was just like, eh, okay. But then when I re-rode and I just looked around and I encourage you to, to do the same thing, look down, look up, look left, look right and listen and smell and do everything because that attraction is a complete assault on your senses. You don't really realize it, especially if you've already done a uh, flight of passage and you're expecting this thrill. You don't get a thrill. It's not a thrill ride, but it's it's Pirates of the Caribbean on another planet, like I said before, but it's just complete immersion in that world. 
from the animals on the leaves above your heads to the the chattering and the chittering of the <laughs> the creatures. Is chittering a word? I think chittering is a word. I'm not even looking that up. I'm I'm going with chittering. I'm not editing this at all. Chittering it is to the screens that have the Navi kind of walking away off in the distance to the water, to the cool floating animals, to then to the Navi shaman at the end. I know once in a while she doesn't operate correctly. And there's like a video screen showing like a video of a Navi shaman or whatever they do. Uh, When you get to see the shaman at the end, that finale of the attraction. And again, she's singing a song. (laughs) I, I laugh at myself when I do that, but it is just, it's just such a cool finale to the attraction. So, yeah. Navi River Journey, to me, not a flop at all. And by the way, the Satuli Canteen, great place to eat. It's the first time I ate there this past trip this summer. Food was really good. Way better than I expected. So, yeah, check that out next time you go. As my friend Johnny Schwartzleaf said when we were there together, they have an excellent, excellent Banshee burger there <laughs> at the Satuli Canteen. And that is going to do it for this week's episode of the Ear to Their Disney Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope it wasn't too much of a downer. I tried to make it fun. I wanted to do this episode for a while. Because, again, Disney doesn't do everything right. They do they do almost everything right, <laughs> according to me. But, yeah, there's been some big-time flops, some big-time money wasters over the years. So I wanted to kind of call attention to that. So thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, just let me know about it. Send me a message. Head over to to eartotheirtravel.com slash message and let me know what you thought about this show, about the past shows, about the time travel series that I did a few episodes back. I want to hear about it. And everyone who sends me a message in the month of September, will be eligible for a free candle from the Magic Candle Company. So yeah, let me know what you thought about the episode. Again, the address for that is eartotheirtravel.com slash message. Okay, just remember, there will be a new episode of the Ear to Their Disney podcast each and every Monday, as well as a new episode of the Word of the Week, or It's a Food World, on Wednesday or Thursday. So until next time, thank you again so, so, so much for listening. I really appreciate it. Have yourself a fantastic week. Bye-bye. Here to thirst.